You're rolling? Yep, yeah, rolling. Rolling. We're waiting for your... Uh... There we go. <laughs> it always uh, every, every time. Well, not every time. Last time was actually perfect. It was pretty good. Yeah, it was pretty good. Anyways, uh, this... Or, uh, how do we start again? Welcome to the Source Points Podcast. I'm Dr. Chris. And I'm Alan Chatney. And uh, in this podcast, we talk about all things uh, geosciency, oil industry, and sometimes movies, and sometimes books, and some... Times TV shows. Bunch of stuff. <laughs> and we're delighted today to have our guest, as soon as I can turn the volume down here, <laughs> our guest, uh, Kathleen Dory. Welcome, Kathleen. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Uh, and thanks for making your way over here. Yeah, much to be warmer here. this week than last yes, week. Yes, thank you for yeah. taking that into consideration when asking me over. I may not have shown up last week. I was buried in uh, power outages and electrical problems in our office. So. There yeah. you go. And now it's ridiculously warm. Yeah. Man. It's, it's absurdly warm. My wife is saying that all the snow's looking like it might melt in the next That's, two weeks. It's yeah. crazy. The long term yeah, yeah. forecast is. Get the golf clubs out. Yeah, almost. <laughs> exactly. Patio weather. It's last, above. Yeah, it's and last above. year this time it was ridiculously cold because my uh, mother in law was in from Australia and it was like minus thirty. So it was pretty pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Almost like an eighty degree difference for her from Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Fires yeah it was. And I understand they got some rain out in Australia finally. Yeah, they that's right. Some of these fires, and that's good yeah. news for those guys. Well, they're out in uh, Western Australia, where it isn't there's just the normal fire season, not the crazy one that's going on out east. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I shouldn't say normal. So Kathleen, tell us a little bit about what you've been up to and yourself and the background, your background, and um, just introduce yourself okay. to folks. And we'll... um, so as Al mentioned, I'm Kathleen Dory. I've been in the uh, geophysical side of things in the oil industry for uh, decades. We won't say how many, but okay. quite a while. Um, and uh, I started out with uh, some major oil and gas companies back then. So Texaco, Conoco, that was sort of my background and training. Um, after that, I went to a couple of juniors in town. Uh, one was Ulster Petroleum. Um, so that was when things were, the industry was drilling a lot more just conventional oil and gas. And with Ulster, I probably drilled about 400 wells in oh, three wow. years or whatever. So you remember those days, right? I do. Yeah. I fondly. It yeah. seems like the <laughs> mythical times yeah. almost. Yeah, I'm not yeah. I'm not actually making this up. Yeah, and that we, was just we really our, used to do lots of business. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, after that, I started my own uh, consulting company, um, and I actually thought I'd try that for a year. So geophysical consulting, and I ended up doing it for ten, um, and which was great. And things were booming, and I just happened to connect with all the juniors that had started to create uh, businesses in town, and none of them had geophysicists. That wasn't their model. They would always use consultants. So. Um, that actually went quite well, but after 10 years, I wanted to change. So I ended up going to, uh, BG, which is British gas for a couple of years. They ended up pulling out of Calgary, but, uh, I was, uh, a senior geophysicist there as well as managing a group. Um, after that, an opportunity came up with Patrol Robertson Consulting and that's where I am now. And I've been there about nine years. Um, I'm a partner in the company. There's two of us that own the, well, three of us that own the the company. Two of us are managing partners. And uh, we do all things geoscience. We also now have engineers in our office, but we're an exploration, development, exploitation consulting company. We work in about 40 countries around the world, not obviously at one time, but um, so we have geology, geophysics, petrophysics, we do core work, um, patrol modeling, so static modeling. Uh, we uh, provide st- strategic advice to companies, governments, that sort of thing. Um, so it's a great gig in terms of the variety of work, and it's allowed me to move on to the international side. So before that, I really wasn't doing much international work. And so the timing was great that way. Uh, as you know, things have slowed down locally, although we do probably about 40% of our work in Canada now, uh, but our Canada goes from coast to coast. So oh, so offshore, onshore, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, north, south, yeah. the whole thing. That's yeah. really neat. Now, I know Petrel Robertson's been around for a long, long time. Yeah. How how long has it Petrel- started? In, it, it was originally incorporated in 1972. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. It was like a long yeah. time. So I would say that uh, part of the reason the company's been around a long time is that ability to diversify to morph 
as the industry morphs. Um, and also the reputation of the company is, is global. Um, I'll go to places like India and be talking to someone and they'll say, oh, I know someone from Patrol back in 1997 or something, right? I wasn't there, but the, the brand is global, which is quite interesting considering we've always just had a Canadian office. So, right. But I think that, that sort of, um, that sustainability over a long period of time will get you that that brand too obviously if you can stay around that long you tend to seep into the global world you have more time to seep out seep mm-hmm. into the the global economy on the oil and gas side so it's an interesting thing because there's there are a few a few companies in town that have been around for many decades and and have had to adapt to changing circumstances changing markets uh you know we we might count our own little company amongst those yeah. we're, we're pivoting and doing different things right. than we used to do but like, is, do you find that there are some, you know, some things around the business side of that? Because being an owner, you know, is it is it cost control, cost management? Is it is it a growth strategy? Uh, you know, what it, what is it that drives that durability? Is it just paying attention to the dollars and cents and having rigorous, robust internal systems? How yeah. how is Petrel managed through all of these different downturns, right. including this latest right. pronounced yeah. downturn? Um, I mean, there's always a cost side to it. I would say that that's probably not been the focus of the company over the many decades. I think it's more been um, sort of an insight into what the industry needs and also what the how the industry is evolving. So having a little bit of um, knowledge of where the industry is going so we can adjust our business model to kind of fit that. Uh, for example... I just finished a project in uh, geothermal. Oh, neat! Um, which is a it's a pilot project in Alberta. Um, it's the first pilot in Alberta, actually, that's uh, actually functioning, and now they're they're actually producing electricity. So we also, like you, can recognize um, the opportunities, like Explorer does, and also maybe pr- the perception of this may be something that's going to be happening and we should probably get on board with this and this is something that's going to help drive our business. Um, and I'm just using that as an example. I'm not saying that geothermal's yeah, I taking off and, and going yeah. on. But um, so that's, that's sort of an example of uh, we have a broad enough knowledge and our staff is broad enough in terms of our ability to recognize opportunities and, and niches in the market. Right. So, and, and, and what, what we found is that you can pivot off of core competencies. So the, the classic thinking is, oh, stick to your core business. Just do this one, you know, this thing is what you do, so right. only do that. And if, if we were still trying to license and acquire seismic data in the frontier and the thrust belt, I think we'd be out of business. Uh, we'd be a, a his, you know, we'd be history, yeah. part of history. So yeah. we've pivoted off of that core competency to, okay, well, we're good at doing difficult things, I guess. And, you know, you can, right. we have some other. Right. So, what what is it that is your, the core competency from the outside looking in with Petrel is kind of that geoscience, that deep geoscience yeah. knowledge, yeah. that long history and a good robust um, uh, knowledge base. I think yeah. Isn't, isn't, yeah. isn't that what it is? And, well, and you're right. That could go to geothermal. That could go to mining potentially. Right. Have you done much in the mining space. Uh, we well we are uh, not traditional mining, but we are we do have a minerals project right now. Um, so it's not it's not hard rock, but um, it's another mineral um, similar to lithium. But um, we're kind of keeping it under wraps right now. But um, so yeah, we're doing some of that as well. Neat. Um, I think well, you know there's something that you just said that that uh, clued to what I was going to say next. But um, it'll come I, back. Yeah. The, yeah. The other, it, the other thing is I'm wondering because Chris and I have had lots of discussions around, and Chris gets peppered with questions around, you know. Is are the universities teaching students of today what they need to know? No. Uh, and and Chris has you know, got strong opinions about this. And I wonder, yeah. with your focus on kind of that yeah. knowledge economy and geoscience yeah. knowledge, are you seeing that new grads that are that are interviewing with Patrell Robertson or that you might be considering for internships or different things, do they come out knowing what they need to know? That it, do they have a diverse set of skills? And what do you have any well, thoughts a, on that? That's a very good question because five years ago, I'd say five to eight years ago, I'd say yes. 
but it's changed so much, right? So that they're probably lacking that now. But what I kind of go back to, and I went to school in Ontario, um, and, and we hardly saw oil and gas, right? And going to school, it was more hard, hard rock based. We did seismology and stuff, but I think if you have someone who's strong in the principles of science, you can take it anywhere, right? Right. Right. So, and on the business side and so on, I mean, I'm I'm sure they could, the universities could maybe offer some, and and I think they do, but maybe not systematically, some sort of um, business side to 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 the geoscience students maybe as an option or something and um what do you mean by that the a business side to the so well i mean you get back yeah, um i guess what i'm thinking is like quite often i've seen and you've seen this too in the industry where you get when things were busier you get and I, and i think it's it's hurt our industry is that where you get a lot of people who are spitting out maps black box kind of stuff they don't really understand maybe what the maps are showing or or perhaps they do but there's no they don't understand what it really needs to impact the industry what's the most important map to impact the industry because there is a we're all challenged financially now in terms of of uh, getting our foot in the door saying look and geophysics and science is really important and it can do this for the industry and that for the industry and we've had a lot of pushback on uh, on geophysics because of that um, and I know that there's a lot more emphasis on, okay, value. What value? You can do maps and science and whatever, but bring us the value to that. Do something that's valuable that's going to affect the bottom line. And that's happening more than ever. Right. Absolutely more than ever. And, and that need to connect the what you've done to why you did it or why it and, needs to be done. Right? And the impact. Is it, is it something of value to us, right? Like how is it going to affect? And, and I, you've got four years, say, in an undergrad, and you're not going to. You can't be this business person or whatever, but um, it is, you know, something to think about in terms of the universities. And I, and I think they're, I mean, I'm not that keyed into, you know, what the certain universities are offering these days, but I think they recognize that that's uh, a challenge well, out it, there. It, it, the people that I've talked to, the main problem is with universities, it's the philosophical reason for a university and what universities are supposed to be doing are they yeah you're supposed to be a well-rounded student after right not an industry uh it's not a vocational it's not a vocation i mean i think it should be like don't get me wrong i absolutely think that uh, that the the university education should be about well neither we go go to value and value changes very quickly over time so you start at year one and by mm-hmm. year four, the value of something you've done is changed, possibly changed, possibly is gone, possibly has gone up. Yeah. But it's always this, almost every every so often you've got to consider what is the value in what you're doing? Is yeah. there value in it? Yeah. And that's a really difficult question to actually answer. You know? Well, and yeah. I think I think without being vocational, so if you say, okay, we're not a, if a university isn't a vocational institution, it ought to at least operate at the leading edge of technology, not the way things used to be in terms of, you know, if you think about geophysics and data acquisition and different. And how it's changed, oh, yeah. how changed, how it's so, changed. so much. And so, and what does the industry need and what do they do yeah. and what are the benchmarks and the metrics yeah. and the measurements that we're using today? Universities ought to be leading that. I mean, in some cases, maybe. Oh, maybe they're probably, they are. They, they are. I wouldn't say they're, they're not. It's, it, they get mostly hobbled by uh, lack of funding. I would yeah. have to say right. that's, yeah. that's a really big thing. And that was always the case when I when I worked at the university. Not to say that any of anything I did was hobbled, but it was like, hey, can I get a computer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe. Yeah, you know, and that right there can yeah. hobble a situation. It's not necessarily that they don't want you to go, you know, be innovative and add value to industry. It's maybe you just can't, or shouldn't say can't. What's the word I'm looking for? Yeah. It's just restricted. Well, and we've had lots of discussions around the need for. You talk about, okay, there needs to be a business, there needs to be a business aspect to, uh, you know, to the education of a geoscientist, something that connects to value, right? That's, I think, what you, if I heard you right. The other thing is that, Chris, and I think you've talked a lot about this in your stuff, Chris, is, you know, coding, programming, understanding, you know, different languages, Python, MATLAB, whatever it is, and having a deep and rigorous understanding of that. Because that 
drives value. It dry. It you know helps. And they're not required courses, which is crazy. I can't believe that. It's that is such a unbelievable to me. Right? I, yeah, I I I just I shake my head. It's I talking to university students, and it's not a required course to at geoscience level to do programming. It's it's like an elective. Oh, it's kind of nice to have, but you mm-hmm. don't need it. It's like no way. You, Mm-hmm. If you're going to make an impact in this industry, if you're going to, I think in the future, well, even now, or even in academia, it's oh, not even an God. industry oh, thing, right? For, I mean, either well, side. Well, I, I think people go right to that. There's not too many people that, if you're staying in academia, you, you do programming. Period. But a lot of people going into uh, an undergrad, it's not a requirement. Now that could have changed. That could have mm-hmm. changed in the past three months. The last person I've talked to, you know, some forward thinking is doing it. But again, it's, and it's probably different at different schools. Yeah. Oh, and then there's other things yeah. like languages go out of out of style. Languages change. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the depths of knowledge needed for the language is different. I mean, there's like it's it's time and value that changes rapidly it's actually it's you got to keep on your toes it's it's the, it's the gig economy well i i mean i had to do programming did you yeah what'd you, pro- yeah. What'd you, what'd you oh, program i'm not gonna say which one because <laughs> well, it doesn't it exist been, anymore it could have been for, <laughs> what, fortran fortran still exists uh, uh, bingo uh, <laughs> is it? Yeah. I mean, I don't think people do it, but I, no. I think it exists. Does it still exist? Yeah, I, I believe. So. But I, no I've, one uses I've it never, anymore. I have never touched I, it. I just know to. the word. We had to, but the, to the so we just did it on the fly as needed, right? Yeah, back yeah. then. But well, at uh, the very beginning of at the very very beginning of my career, got, some guys were still talking about just having switched from the card based input systems yeah. where you had to plug these mm. these punched cards yeah. in, and that was. I mean, it seems like that might be like generations ago but it actually wasn't that far that far back i mean it was, it was probably like still 40, used in 40 50 years. there was probably yeah. stuff still running in the 80s on it yeah i'm sure yeah yeah exactly. there would have been still some yeah because yeah. i actually remember coming to the industry and i worked for for john boyd right <laughs> so that was a long time ago and i used to walk across the street with this deck of cards to do our modeling so geophysical modeling mm-hmm. forward modeling mm-hmm. and i i get the cards or whatever. I can't remember how it all worked, but I guess I, I would put they the cards. They had to be in order? Yeah, they had to be in order. You had the big rubber band. Don't you drop them. Across, <laughs> and we'd walk across the street to run the model, you know, and then we'd get the model in about a week. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. And it was like a... And a, it was a service a, company that did a the A 1D modeling. model? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, oh, yeah. but you know what's that funny That was state is, of the art at the time, though. Yeah. Well, and and in, in, a, in a few years, and, you know, 20, 30 years, people will be saying the same thing about You have to yeah. wait an hour? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. check, this, check this old dude out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But it's funny how quickly it moves, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's funny. You mentioned John Boyd, and, and one, of the, one of the things we've talked about on this podcast in the past, we've had guys like Nathan Fester on and, and um, Matt Lennon and some other – some other uh, up and coming, yeah. you know, geoscientists talking about mentorship, right? Yeah. That's something that Nathan's quite keen and focused on. And maybe if you can speak to that, like in, in, you know, as you've come up, you know, the mentoring you've done, the mentoring you've received, you know, what, how has that made a difference? Yeah. I know I've had a sequence of amazing mentors. I still have one actually. Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, how, how does that, um, How well, has that been a part of your career? I, I, you know, when I think back, but of course, John ran this consulting company in, in Calgary and was very well known and had done quite well in the industry for decades. And I started working for him um, prior to Texaco or whatever. So I don't know if it's a coincidence that I ended up consulting and running my own consulting company, two of them now, if that's just a coincidence or if that was John's influence. But it was a very positive experience working for him. Um, and I admire him greatly for what he's done and uh, the the bravery for what I mean they were going back they were in China back in the early years and stuff they were wow. one of the first companies yeah, to go into amazing. China and stuff with Larry Hurd and so on so um, yeah uh, and, and and formal mentors I've never really had any uh, but certainly you know there were certainly people that I connected with on various at various companies um, a lot of the benefits of working for like these American multinationals, there's a lot of training. Mm -hmm. Um, And they put you through the rigors in terms of, you know, if you wanted money and you wanted money to drill a certain program or whatever, you had to go through the whole. There was a process. There was a process and you had to have your story straight or it wasn't going to happen, right? Right. You get shot down. So that was actually kind of a, 
a very good training in terms of the reality of of any business really is okay well why do you want that money and what are you going to do and then you had to be successful on top of that so your drill your wells had to come in i mean if they didn't you're less likely to get the next set of wells drilled right so right. so yeah. yeah so well and, and a multidisciplinary approach also i understand right. i never i mean i worked at uh, schlumberger that was my big my big company experience for 14 years but from, from talking to folks that have worked for companies like Texaco and Chevron and others, you know, it, it was sort of like you had to do a stint in geology and geophysics, yeah. and then you'd be in a meeting and a review with engineers. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, that's happening more and more today, not yeah. less and less. Where yeah. There's a need to, you know, cross disciplines. I think. Yeah. And I, I think that's probably where I get the business side from it as well, because, um, you know, depending on the company, but they were very focused on you got to make money, right? Right. And, and go figure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and, and some some large companies are it's so big that even if you don't make money, it doesn't matter because someone's making money in Oman or something. Right. So it all evens out. But um, depends on the company and, and, and the philosophy. philosophy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 yeah neat. And it's and it's it was interesting to hear you say that you've got some engineers on board now. Increasingly, the geophysicists that we're talking to speak engineering ease if that's a language like yeah. they're they're very very acutely aware of what the drilling and completions engineers need to know right and they're speaking that language yeah. in a way that maybe the geophysicist of 20 or 30 years ago didn't have to right necessarily or no, didn't it, didn't you know it wasn't like as central to the right to the role I think. right is that is that well, fair is that what you're seeing yeah and, and that's particularly to western canada right i mean if you that's a, a wholly on an international space side of things it's not as prevalent or as necessary okay. so when you go back to what people need depending on where you're working but it's really you're, you're, you're right it's at the forefront here mm -hmm. um, and out of we're all sort of pressed for the economy the economy of making things go right now so if you can make that connection and with the engineers because they they need to know the value of of why you're there and Whereas on an international side, I mean, they're, they're not even dealing with unconventional reservoirs yet, really. I mean, there are pockets, but they're still just drilling and producing and flowing wells. Why would you? I mean, some of these, right. you know, you're making three or four or five or ten mil million barrels a day without touching the unconventionals. Right. You're in business. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not right. a problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fascinating. Yeah. And you think about, I've always thought about when the Middle East, you know, sw it starts making the conversion and... and go into the unconventionals, that'll be a whole nother level in terms of yeah. their yeah. reserves and resources. And, and yeah. I mean, Canada is really poised to, to do well with that, right? We have so much knowledge on that. And, mm. and you know, when you talk about Patrell, asking me about Patrell being uh, the longevity and so on, we, we can, that's our bargaining chip in terms of, we've been through it all in Canada, right? So from exploration through to exploitation to development, uh, conventional, unconventional, oil sands, which is people still call that unconventional. So that's something that we can bring on the global to the global scale. That I mean, they're just not even there for a lot of that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's tons of of oil sands around the world that haven't even been exploited yet. So yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's something that that Canadians should be proud of. We are. Um, and say, listen, look, this is what we're doing. We do this really well, mm. and we can help you out. Yeah, and the other the other interesting thing that I've seen, and you know, working at different in different centers around the world and different sort of oil and gas uh, areas, there are very few places in the world that have the density and the network that we have mm -hmm. here in Calgary. If you think about, you know, we don't even usually have to go outside to go for a meeting. We're all within this, almost all within this few blocks right. of being downtown Calgary, right. whereas you go across the border into the U.S. and you could be in Houston or Midland or Dallas or Denver or Pittsburgh or you right. know any number of San Oklahoma City or something. I mean, right. it's actually quite distributed. And the same is mm -hmm. true in Europe and the same is true to a lesser extent in the Middle East where you've got all these different centers depending on the country you're in. So, right. so that's a kind of, I think, both an advantage and a disadvantage in right. different ways. Right. Um, when it comes to our expertise and our ability to create value internationally. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, well, we're very entrepreneurial here. 
um, the free market system and all that, um, whereas a lot of the world is still, you're still dealing with, uh, say, outside of North America anyway, you're dealing with uh, national oil companies. Mm. Completely different scope of things, right? Yeah. Uh, things move very slowly. They're not used to the, diversif- the diversity of, of companies and, and the, uh, the technologies that are necessarily out there. They control... Um, you know, for example, Mexico, um, it was run by a national oil company for 40 or 50 years. No right. one else did anything but that national oil company. So so dealing with those kinds of systems and saying, hey, look, we do these wonderful things. Well, that's fine, but they're in control, right? So it's a, it's a whole other challenge on the international side. It's not to say it can't be done, but it's a different... It's a different, different cadence and a oh, different yeah. culture and a very yeah. different, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Land sale here every two weeks, yeah. might be once a year in another in another right. country or every if couple at of all. years, yeah, if, if, at, if all. at all, yeah, because yeah, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, cool. Um, so switching gears a little bit, mm-hmm. we're all yeah. uh, everybody here at the table, Chris, myself, and you, I know, are all active volunteers in different ways mm-hmm. uh, in the discipline, um, and you uh, gently twisted my arm to join the. Uh, CSCG Foundation, and and you're the president of that foundation now, right? Right. Um, About to hand it off to somebody else, I think, but maybe uh, a little bit of background on what your vision for the foundation is and what we've been up to, uh, what you've been up to, and and where you see that that important organization going. Right. Well, just a bit of a background on the the CSCG Foundation. So it's it's the charitable arm of the CSCG. and it started sort of uh, mid 2000s. Um, there was an opportunity for a lot of people wanted to contribute to the education of the industry and scientific endeavors and so on. And that's our mission uh, to do that. Um, this was an opportunity to to contribute even more. And and there's a, a tax benefit obviously on the, the charitable side. So um, and also. It went into a, a number of funds, so then you're also sort of having these funds that are going to be out there for decades or whatever. So that was kind of the mentality behind it, and um, it's done very well, mm-hmm. uh, particularly up to 2008, because when they started in 2005 or six, the industry was doing well. People wanted to contribute. They were very grateful for what the industry had done for them, and they wanted to, to give back to the society and so on. So, so that's kind of where it all started. Um, and certainly we've seen a uh, decline uh, in terms of contributions, and the industry itself and membership has declined. So, of course, your contributions are, are declined. But um, So I was asked to, to chair the foundation uh, a couple of years ago now, and uh, Ron Larson was the, the chair at the time, and right. he wanted to, to move on. Um, and so I said, sure, I would be uh, happy to, to uh, uh, volunteer for the foundation, and uh, my preference was to chair the board as opposed to we were looking for some finance people to volunteer and so on and then fund development. But just to let you know, Al, that you were actually uh, sought after for the position, <laughs> the okay. volunteer position. We actually have a process right. and names go into to that that uh, that process and, and it's a collective decision as to who we want to invite onto the board. So, um, but... Um, well, I appreciate that, and it's yeah. been for me. It's been it's been a lot of fun to plug in and and kind of learn the ropes. We had we sort of taking over from some very astute uh, fund development committee uh, folks who who did a great job, and and the handover was very smooth. Yeah. And now Darren Condrad and I are right. are looking after that and sort of, you know, we, we look to change things, but kind of respecting the past and respecting yeah. what's been done so yeah. far. So yeah, yeah. Um, but I did want to talk about the programs that we do uh, support. And when I came into um, the, the position as I was vice chair first, um, I looked at, at the things that we're supporting and I also looked at where the industry is and it's a tough spot. And uh, what I wanted to see and is what we just started talking about was I wanted to see an advocacy component to it. So advocating for... The, science, the discipline, the science of geophysics, the industry, oil and gas, or or geophysics, it's oil and gas, geophysics, oil and it? gas, geophysics, and yeah. not only oil and gas ge- geophysics, but the science, right? Right. 
we do great things, we can do great things, and I think we've really taken a beating on that, right, I, from various directions. Um, and I think, like a lot of other people in town, I think, you know, we have to advocate. I do it daily. I advocate yeah. for myself and what I do. But I think the in, right, and you do too, but the industry, I, I saw as CSEG as a, as a um, we could do that through the foundation because we can educate and we can do look at scientific endeavor from that charitable point of view. And I wanted to see that as a component. So that was kind of my vision coming in. So I wanted to, to, to do that, to say, listen, um, we can do this. I, don't, I didn't see anyone else really doing it around it. And, and I have to say there, there's been some previous work and, and this is a little bit different because what I'm suggesting is we advocate to the influencers, to the people that are right. um, making the decisions in town as opposed to advocating just the science. We, we will advocate the science, but to decision makers. So two initiatives right now with the foundation, and I think this is important to get across as a fund development um, it, it person. Absolutely is. is it okay, we've been doing all this fantastic stuff, and I'll get to that. We have 11 programs that we support um, on the on the charitable side. Great stuff. But on top of that, now we're doing two, this year we're doing two advocacy um, components. And one is we have a, a, a meeting with a, a group of parliamentarians oh, in fantastic. Ottawa. Oh, fantastic. In That's, Ottawa. Yeah. Um, now we're supporting that. We have volunteers that are going to do that and put that presentation together. Mm. But it's elevating the industry to, I wanted to see it elevated to a, a, a level where we can go, hey, wait a minute, we do, we do great stuff here. You know? mm, right, and we and we can diversify our skills. Let's get the knowledge of our skills out there, and tell people we we can do fantastic stuff, and we, and we do, we do. You That's know, it's amazing. not all very negative stuff that you can hear and read about in the industry ad nauseum yeah. right now. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And so that's that's going on in the spring. And then the other thing that we're doing, and I say we in a very general term because there are tons of volunteers behind. It's not me. That's the other thing I was struck you. by is how many volunteers yes. and how big and robust this whole yeah. initiative is. It's, we have it's impressive. about 2,000 members, I think, in the CSEG. Now, that's a wavering number, but that's the membership. But And that's across Canada. Right. But... Um, there are a lot of volunteers behind all of these initiatives and very grateful for, you know, as you get involved with this stuff, you can see what, what these people do. Yeah, and, it's amazing. Uh, and we're actually almost running out of volunteers because the society is kind of contracted so much. But um, the other advocacy thing that I wanted to mention was um, we're supporting this um, discovery. It's called a discovery um, course, and it's and it's a, um, it's a course where we're trying to bring influencers from around the world to come and see the Canadian industry. Right, yeah. And, I think and this you, Maida seen, Boromond has right. been quite uh, vocal about this. Right, and, and, and she's the one that's spearheading it. Yeah. And she's the president of the CSEG. When you say influencers, what do you mean? Well, um, so they're actually targeting people who would be uh, expiration VPs or, or CEOs. Um, and basically, there it's it's a course where you come to Calgary. The SEG is involved, and uh, they're going to take people um, to the potash mining side. Uh, they're taking them to a micro seismic a site um, to the, on the south uh, to the south. I think the one it's a tied in with the U of C's work. Oh, that I would think. be the Cami site, right? I think yeah. so. Oh yeah. Uh, don't quote me on all of this this no. itinerary. It's, yeah, it's all on it's all on the website. It's being but developed. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But okay. um, so the idea is to show. The fantastic things that we can do. There's also an oil sand side. I think they're going to go up to the mine site and so on. Um, uh, the, the technology that we use, the, the imaging that we can do, the diversity of our industry. Um, so those are, those are all great things. And it's targeting sort of more the influencers level. Right. Um, you know, to, to bring in potential investment, um, just to let people know that we're here and this is this is what we do, right? That's fantastic because yeah. we've already been doing a lot of advocacy, but in a different way, right? Yes. Earth Science for Society is a form of advocacy right. where you know students from around Calgary come in and they're seeing science and they understand, oh, wait, these aren't big, nasty things. These are, right. this is actually really cool, right. really interesting. I might want to do this. You're right. And, and, and that's, you know, but but I think hitting that, Hitting that on multiple levels, it, you know, it's education, you know, 
uh, there's a teaching element to that right. advocacy, right? I right. think, and then also just standing up for ourselves. Yes, yeah, so exactly. Sort of go together yeah. in a way, right? Yeah. And, so if you just allow me to, to just go over the rest of the programs, right? So you're, you're right. We have Earth Science for Society, which is the the schools and the uh, the teachers and the public are open to that, and it's taken off like crazy, and we support that. Uh, we've got the Canadian Distinguished Lecture Tour, which Dave Eaton's doing fantastic, presently. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, and that's got quite a, a history behind it. And that's, uh, he goes, whoever the distinguished lecturer is, goes across country promoting a certain, they're talking about their specific work or research or whatever. And then again, it, it's an advocacy uh, kind of thing. But to the universities, um, there is, um, we do scholarships. Mm -hmm. uh, we fund some scholarships. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of the other programs, but the Junior Geophysicist Forum, so exactly, that there's yeah. networking and there's there's a mentorship program for the the and new entrants. And that's a fantastic. That I yeah. really I really enjoy that. That's been big, big part of our world the last few years. Yeah, that's great. yeah. So there's a lot of programs out there that uh, that the CSCG Foundation funds and promotes, and it's an excellent uh, an excellent program and a lot of foresight. You know, I'd have to say those people back. And isn't gift part of the part of You're the right. program? There's so that's gift and geophysical then, industry field trip. And there's also the challenge bowls, that's I right. think. And, yeah. and uh, gosh, anyway, it's amazing. It's yeah. just been it's been a delight to be a part of it and, yeah. and to kind of un learn a little bit about how much goes into all the all the background here. Yeah. If if by the way, if anybody's listening to this podcast <laughs> and decides that they want to step up and volunteer, there's lots of room for volunteers. Right. right? right. We need all the help Absolutely. we can get. Absolutely. Um, and also um, any sort of contributions, financial or otherwise, are certainly appreciated. Yeah, and I mean, I think I think the thing to realize, and I, I think you know, some of the some of the people that raise money for almost for a living, the, the politicians in our world, have understood that even small donations can actually make quite an impact. Yeah, we don't usually edit at all. But we'll oh, that. there's an edit right here. Hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah, first ever edit on Source Points podcast. I'm honored. We got blasted by <laughs> by a computer <laughs> virus warning, yeah. and uh, so we're back now. Yeah. But I was just saying, small donations can make can make quite a difference, and and you get a, ch a charitable donation receipt. You can That's donate right. through Canada Helps if your company's a participant in Benevity. You can do it through that. Right, to, right on know, the CSCG website. Right on the CSCG website, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there's lots of ways to d donate, and if if you can't, and some people volunteer and donate. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been quite impressed with with that whole world. Yeah. 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 It's good. So what are you doing? It doesn't sound like you have much spare time, Kathleen. Like, what do you do in your spare time? Are you are you active in other I, ways? I uh, golf in the summer and try to ski in the winter, but uh, I, okay. broke, I broke my back skiing. Oh, oh so ouch. It's been a while. But you, you're <laughs> fully healed up now? Or? I am. I'm just a little nervous about going back. Yeah, under oh, understandable. But, ouch. But, but, but no paralysis of any kind? No. No. Dodge that bullet. Dodge Ouch. that bullet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have hurt. But uh, yeah, uh, so hopefully I'm I'm trying to get back this winter, and then the golfing. I'm I'm a new golfer, but love being out there in the sunshine and you know the long summers and heading to Palm Springs. Did here. you say long summers in long, Calgary? Long summer evenings. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, so, not long summers. Yeah. Well, and, and certainly much less likely to break your back golfing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that would just, be yeah. a yeah. very difficult thing to do. But or, who but, knows? It's like uh, as long as you're healed, yeah, right? Because the swing actually. Oh, I know. It's a. I'm it's sure, a, you've worked this all out. Well, it's a challenge, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, but um, heading to Palm Springs shortly with the club, so that'll be fun. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. That's. Uh, I'm not that good. I'm a beginner, but it's fun. Yeah, I'm an absolutely terrible golfer. Yeah, uh, it turns out my personality doesn't mesh <laughs> well with the sport. <laughs> <laughs> Chris will understand this very yeah. well, but uh, yeah. I I do enjoy it when I'm out there, especially when I have a good foursome. Right, you have yeah. a lot of fun, and and it's a great afternoon. It's a social thing, yeah. I think it was Churchill yeah. that said golf is a is a is basically a way to ruin a perfectly good walk or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the quote, or something like that. But, yeah, uh, it is fun, and and. Uh, you know, it'll be the golf season will be upon it. Well, in Palm Springs, it's always golf season. Yeah, it'll be upon us before we know it. Yeah, here. yeah. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's just seems, it just seems like the weeks and months are just racing by. Yeah, uh, I actually joined a women's league. Oh, golf league. So oh, that's a good thing. Beginners, yeah. so perfect. Yeah, not intimidating. Lots of fun. Very social. Yeah, that's that's it's, the. Secret, and you're going right? to crush them, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> no, it's 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 all about it's all about that. And and you know, a sport where you can kind of have a beer while you're playing it. Yeah. You know, that's kind yeah. of fun too. Yeah. Right? So yeah. good. Okay. We're at the forty minute mark. Are we? Yeah, yeah. we're always conscious because we think this says a forty eight minute limit on it. Yeah, I've, I haven't changed whether that's it, so. self imposed or I, I can change it. That's but probably long enough. It's probably long <laughs> enough. Yeah. But this is where we talk about other things. Like, okay. Yeah. So, well, we can we can shift to whatever. Um, I'm uh, we always end up talking a little bit about movies. Okay. Uh, in part because my uh, it's kind of one of our hobbies in our family. Uh, my son's going to go see The Gentleman tonight. I see advertisements for it. Looks oh, pretty it's quite good. Guy uh, Ritchie, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. I think he's it's like in a, it. It looks it's like a star-studded star studded yeah. event yeah. of yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think mob that's... proportions. I believe. Yeah, it looks I very think so. Mob-ish. Guy Ritchie movie. Oh yeah. And, yeah. So. Oh. And so what's he, the rating on it, or how is it? What's well, the, probably R. Looks definitely. No, uh, I meant oh. in terms of star rating, oh. like um, yeah, like on IMDb like or Rotten Tomatoes. Five, I four don't or five. Know. Or, I haven't looked. We could. One day we're going to have somebody in production that can answer the question <laughs> for us. As well. Oh, well, maybe next time we will have we'll have cams and that ability to be yeah. like, hey Chris, just put it up on the screen there. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're trying yeah. to go. Joe Rogan's our uh, is our idol here for this kind of stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I did see the trailer for it. So yeah, yeah. it looks fantastic. Yeah. 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 So we'll go see that. Have you seen any good movies lately? Have you taken any? Um, Are you a movie buff at yeah, all? Yeah. 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 I'm trying to think of one that I've seen lately that's really good. What I'm finding now is the is movies and TV, that line is blurring. Yeah. It's really interesting to see well, the people like the long form. Uh, it's sort of like TV binge shows. Watch, it's it's turning into like we're now saying binge watching. Sounds like it would be a bad thing, but it's people say it in a positive way that, oh, I've been binging. Yeah, I watched uh, season you know, one through 18 on the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. What? I didn't sleep at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and so that's interesting. And, and as a result, I think partly as a result of that, the movies are getting very, very long. Like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Quentin Tarantino's like three hours or something. Yeah, it was a long movie. I did right? see that. And I yeah. love that. Yeah, movie. that was, was a good. great movie. It was good. Um, the, oh, um, uh, the you know, Irish... Why watch movies when you can watch seasons of uh, storylines that intertwine yeah. rather than like, what happened? Ah, uh, wizard did it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, really? Okay, next thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they do that in TV shows anyways, but in movies, yeah. they have to do it. That's did right. I say TV shows? Yeah, no, in movies, they got to do it on the, they got to do it constantly. Fix, 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 fast, fast, fast. Yeah. I did see Joker just, that, just recently. Oh, I, it's on my list. I, it's, I thought it was really good. It's I fantastic. I, I really like him, too, in terms of an actor, not his personality or anything, but I don't know anything about him. But Joaquin um, Phoenix. Right, right. But, yeah, he did a really good. Have you seen it? I have seen it. Yeah. And, and he, it's quite he, good. He did an amazing job. He's pretty job intense. In I think that's why he's, you know, his, his acting is fairly intense, so. Well, and if you yeah. think about the, the actors that have that have acted the part of Joker, it's getting to be quite the list. Like yeah. Jack Nicholson, yeah. Heath Ledger, Heath Ledger, yeah. and famously. Died. And I'll say the first guy. Anybody remember his name from the nineteen sixties? From the TV show? Yeah. Oh. Well, that was less of a dark Joker. That was more yeah. of a more <laughs> comical of a cartoon. Comical <laughs> and Joker. who was it? Oh, Romero. Okay. You brought it up, but don't. <laughs> Cesar Romero. Cesar Romero. Oh, Cesar. really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. What I, else I, did he do? I don't. Know. I have no idea. It was the he 60s. Was a, he was a Hollywood <laughs> guy, though. Yeah, he was, was a, a Hollywood actor. Yeah, yeah, it was every time they needed like a quote unquote ethnic guy, um, I get Caesar in there. Have him do yeah. his accent thing. I suppose that was yeah, the you're Joker right. an ethnic character. No, no, I wasn't. Though. I didn't think so. Yeah. Okay. But with but a name like Caesar Romero. Cesar Romero. Yeah. 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 Anyway, no, that's it'll be interesting, and the Oscars are coming up uh, here in a few weeks, and so we're always uh, we always sort of make an event out of that and, and kind of watch it. And, yeah. You know, so you haven't seen Joker yet? I have. Oh, yeah. you have. I, I have not. It was it's, phenomenal. Oh, you haven't. I've got kids, so the closest we did is we watched the uh, Fantastic Beasts. Oh yeah. And that's J.K. Rowling's more slightly more oh, adult right. uh, uh, in the past wizard. Wizard series is it pre Harry? Is it the it's Harry Potter? Harry Potter. Uni- yeah, it it's Harry a, Potter universe. It's a Harry Potter universe, but it's set in the twenties. Yeah, in oh. the, so it's huh. and uh, uh, the kids like them. I I'm uh, I'm okay with fantasy, but I always I always tell them watch for the. I'm like watch a wizard did it. 
Where did that happen? A wizard did it. How did they fix it? A wizard did it. You know, like that's essentially like the entire plot. I mean, the same thing. That's like Star Wars. What happened? A space wizard did it. <laughs> like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Keep going. Yeah, that's funny. So, I'll, but so I haven't seen any new movies, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, with the younger with younger kids, you're you're uh, very limited. You're limited. It's hard to break away yeah. and go to a. Go to but a more, enjoy it now. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy it. It goes quick. No, yeah. no, no. That's ketchup. It's that's ketchup on his head. <laughs> <laughs> He's just sleeping. Yeah, it's I just, wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend Joker for your kids. No, yeah. Do not. It'll be permanently scarred. Yeah. yeah. It's funny because every once in a while you make a mistake. We were talking about this, I think, in one of the one of the last episodes. But I was kind of reminded after that that we were we were in Japan one time with one with my with my kids and took kind of did a family trip and we went to this amusement park in Kyoto. You know, talk about age appropriate entertainment. Okay, so we're you think, okay, it's an amusement park. And we go into this thing, and of course, we can't read Japanese. <laughs> and all the signs are in Japanese, and, and only in Japanese. Yeah. And so we go into this haunted house, and I'm thinking, I don't know if you've ever been to the haunted house in Disneyland. It's fantastic, oh. okay? And it's totally age appropriate. You go in there with kids. Because right. it's Disneyland. Because yeah. it's Disneyland. Well, right. we're in this park that we this really don't murder understand. Land. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. Oh. Like, <laughs> we went into this haunted house, and there's like, murder scenes and oh, gore and geez. blood and now we're trapped because you, you, you got go to go through to get horrified. out you got to go through to get out yeah. we're screwed <laughs> I, I, I look at the boys they're both traumatized i basically go we're getting out of here and i grab i grab my youngest son and we literally run through the haunted house and there's like axe murders and everything oh. we're running through this thing it was terrible and we get outside, and, and my wife said, when you came out, you looked like you had post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> Happy holidays. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, welcome to Japan. So anyways, it does happen. Oh. I, I joke that you know your, your oldest kids will be the most limited, typically. And then mm -hmm. the rules seem to morph and change. At least that's what I found. Yeah, it, yeah because those, uh, a lot of the uh, Harry Potters are PG-13. And my six-year-old has watched them. That's because... His sisters have been watching. Yeah. Well, I want to watch it too. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, they right. can get kind of dark too. You yeah, know, Harry like, Potter stuff. Yeah. Well, and and also the other thing is the changing ratings over time. Like I think, oh yeah, R in 1985 is probably PG 13 in 2019. Isn't that? Uh, yeah, because I wanted because I, I want to watch have my kids watch stuff that I grew up with, like Goonies or gremlins or something yeah. and gremlins if, if you're familiar with it which you may not be i do it's, for, isn't yeah. it water or something that, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, so, it, anyway. and we did i wanted to watch it because that's baby yoda looks like gizmo from gremlins yeah. so i was like hey this is gonna be great this will confuse the kids to know it. <laughs> yeah and in the 80s it's rated pg and i i bet if we watched it now it'd be like no this is a pg-13 there's there's uh there's death Oh, so you think the ratings went the other way? It, I think it went up. Like in, oh. in the eighties, it's like, yeah, whatever. Just show that happening. God, someone's getting know. killed. It's, yeah, think, it's all right. I think it's worked kind of both ways because things that were extremely edgy, you know, The Godfather, for example, in the seventies, is kind of run of the mill violence now, right? And it, that's what I was thinking. Well, how about yeah. this? Jaws is PG. Jaws was PG when it, it came it out? It is. It still is yeah. on uh, Netflix. I it, but I thought it was my R kid, when it came out. My kid it saw that. It could have been. Well, like, I think it was R when it came no, out. No, because I wouldn't have been able to see it. <laughs> ah. And I remember seeing it. So. Yeah, it's PG. And my kids are like, let's watch it. I'm like, I don't think you want to do that. I think I've just uncovered my parents in a lie. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't allowed, allowed to, to see, see it. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was pretty terrified after I saw that. Yeah. 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 Didn't want to go in the water for a while. <laughs> and I'm going to have to uh, say we are reaching the... We're reaching the end? We're reaching the end. It could Any just last cut it. thoughts? Any last thoughts, Catherine? No, thank you for the opportunity. Great chatting with you. We don't we don't get a chance to talk much. Yeah, Actually, we're both busy and yeah. nice to meet you, Chris. Oh, nice to meet you too. Yeah, that was great. And uh, so once again, Kathleen Dory, thanks very much for joining us. Yeah, we, Thank you. And uh, this is Source Points Podcast. Yeah. And we'll see if my... We're going to see if it's going to uh, cut off. It could cut, cut off. off just. just All right. I could also go. make manually cut it off so it this sounds like outro. we were perfect. Jeez, where are we here? There we go. There you go. There we go. <laughs> Whoa, hey, we never heard that before. This is a, this song is long. Oh, like it's, geez. It's got, it's got depth to it, Chris. This is. Oh. Yeah, we've never heard this part of the song. Oh, 
Okay, anyways. <laughs> anyways, uh, th- th- uh, how do we end it? Uh, that was the Source Points podcast. Uh, thanks see for you next listening. time. I'm Dr. Chris. I'm Alan Chatney. I'm Kathleen Dory. And we'll see you next time. See ya.